Let us join together in this call to worship. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tombs restoring life. Christ is risen. Alleluia, the risen Christ is with us. Thanks be to God, Alleluia. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, gracious God, we come to you this day, this special day of the year, in which we reflect upon the life of your Son, how you transformed death that we all face into something that we can face because of him, because of his resurrection, and we have hope for new life in so many ways, in all aspects of our life. You gave him to us to teach us your ways, to show us your truths, to show us how to walk in that way as his disciples. And we ask that you give us the strength and the courage that he had to do that work together as your people as your Easter people. We lift up to you our praises this day and our gratitudes for all of those who um, have made this worship service beautiful. We thank you for our young people and our youth leaders. We thank you for the worship team and all of those who faithfully around the year have been part of making this church active in our community so that we can say boldly that indeed Christ lives in Haver, Montana, and we see him around us each day as people care for one another and give love and hope and charity to those who are in need. We especially ask for those who are in need today, O oh Lord, those who are in need of a home, those who are in need of a meal, but especially those who are in need of healing, like Jerry uh, this morning. We especially lift up Jerry and his leg for healing. We pray for the safety of Emily and Tyler in the Middle East. And we're grateful that Morgan is well, that Sheila's oldest is safe. And give thanksgiving for, for that as well. And we pray that you be with each person as they are out and about and traveling on this day of people traveling to see family, we ask your safety upon them. In all things, O oh God, we ask that you make us mindful of the cost of what it is to be called your Easter people, that indeed sacrifices were made, uh, that your sacrificial love is something that you place in our hearts as Christ still continues to live within each one of us, help us to do our best to, to pray that prayer and to live that life that he did. And let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May thy kingdom come, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to point Joy up to give us the gospel readings. Scripture reading comes from John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, 
and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid them. When she had said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary! She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine the sounds two days before this event that Joy read about. Imagine the sounds of the grinding and the scraping of stone upon stone. And then silence. Jo Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two disciples who had once worshipped Jesus in secret, are now boldly taking down his body, taking linens for his burial and 100 pounds of spices, and wrapping his body and burying him, taking him to a tomb and rolling the stone in front of it. Their hearts had been changed, hadn't they? God had rolled away a stone from their hearts in which they had been afraid to say that they were disciples of Jesus. But now they were publicly doing an act of devotion, the last act of devotion they would do for their Lord, so they thought. They straightened up from their strenuous labor, heavy breathing slowed, and tear-reddened eyes could barely meet each other. Their initial shock and disbelief at hearing of Jesus' arrest became anger and rage when they heard about the abuse and the mockery at the trials, and then horror and grief as they witnessed the slow, horrific death on the cross. All that joy and wonder of being with Jesus had been crushed and drained into despair and desolation in the silent, empty dusk of a garden on Friday night. And with heavy hearts, they rolled that stone, sealing that bright vision and their hopes of God's kingdom into a dark tomb. So often in our society, we want to go directly to Easter without remembering what happened on Good Friday. The only, I heard this week that the only reason Friday is good is because of Easter. But now, imagine that cool damp of the morning, two days later, as a woman steps carefully along the dark pathway of the garden toward the tomb. You know, her own body would have bent over from that weight of sorrow and emotional devastation from the crucifixion. Mary is stunned with both disbelief and horror at the memories of that violence against her beloved Rabboni, her teacher. Now, what Mary Magdalene planned to do at the tomb, we don't know. Perhaps she meant to sit Shiva with Jesus, but 
this is the important thing, that Mary instinctively knew what to do when times were hard, when everything seemed dark and hopeless. She needed to be near Jesus. You see, Mary Magdalene had emerged for her, from her own sort of tomb, in a way. She'd long lived under the shadows of evil. Then she met Jesus. According to Luke chapter 8, Jesus had released her from a spiritual darkness into new life. Through Jesus, God had rolled away a stone from her heart that had been imprisoned, and she was freed to live fully again a life of faith, and a life in which she was restored to community. In fact, she had a new community. Community No longer was she outcast, but Mary now belonged to other people. She was not alone. Her faith and her gratitude to Jesus was obvious as she had devoted her life to traveling with Jesus and even took her own money to help support and feed the other disciples and the poor people that Jesus naturally traveled with. When Mary saw that the tomb had a stone rolled away from it, when Mary encountered the resurrected Jesus, it would make sense that she would proclaim this amazing news. The stone is rolled away. He is risen. I saw him. He lives. Now, her newfound community that had shared so many meals with her and had traveled so many miles with her, they were her family, weren't they? She and the other women and men had supported each other. And they were supporting each other even through this that they thought was the end of everything that they had hoped for. Earlier this month in the newsletter, I mentioned a a song by Lauren Dago. Her powerful voice echoes the experience of Mary Magdalene and Joseph of Marathea and Nicodemus and all countless other people whose lives have been transformed by the power of this living Christ. The song is called Still Rolling Stones and it speaks to the power of resurrection in our own personal lives. Here's some of the lyrics. Six feet under, I thought it was over, an answer to prayer, the voice of a savior. Rise up, rise up. I thought that I was too far gone for everything I'd done wrong. Yeah, I'm the one who dug my, this grave, but you called my name. You called my name. All at once, I came alive. This beating heart, these open eyes, the grave let go, the darkness should have known you're still rolling, rolling. You're still rolling stones. It's not surprising that the disciples had a hard time believing the women who came back to bring this news that the stone had been rolled away and that Mary had seen Jesus. It is outrageous and astound astounding news, isn't it? In the Gospel according to Luke, Peter called it an idle tale of the women, which was a polite translation for the original Aramaic, that he called it BS, in kind of words. But as they encountered the living Christ, they too, one by one, came to realize that this was true. It was not BS, for God who was crucified was risen and draws all people to him to heal all of creation into full restoration again. It's an old story, I know, and we know it so well, we hear it each year, but from our own personal experiences, we know that it is true too. How many of us have had a person or been the person who was struggling with hard times, difficult times, and we cried out to God in the midst of that Despair and transforming power met us. Perhaps a sense of peace and calm surrounded us, and we slowly became made whole, lifted up again in the love and the grace of God. This result that happens to just one individual is good news for a whole community, isn't it? 
As each individual is brought back into life through faith, they impact those around them, their family, their community, their church. We're all strengthened as each one of us becomes made whole. About a, about a year ago, a man told me about the time when he looked, and this is his word, straight into the darkness of the tomb, and he knew that we don't raise ourselves. My friend is a member of the Narcotics Anonymous group where I was serving, and the message of Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon and other 12-step groups is adamant that recovery from addictions doesn't happen just through your own willpower. Recovery is a form of resurrection. It's getting your life back again from the dead of addictions. How? By calling on a higher power and leaning into your community in the hard times. I'm going to quote my friend. He said, we can't run away from these feelings of guilt and shame. You've got to feel your feelings, not numb yourself. Feelings can motivate you to do your part in changing your life and be a part of a supportive, loving community. Love saves lives. Love is everything. And sometimes resurrection happens to whole communities and churches too. This morning as I was driving to Chester, I was listening to, uh, I was driving white knuckled, let me tell you, the roads were bad. But I was listening to the radio to get my mind off the roads. And I was listening to a new study that had come out talking about teenagers and how so many teenagers, uh, we kind of all knew this, especially teachers, but they're especially impacted by feelings of isolation following COVID and having a hard time getting their sense of community again. I'm so grateful for our youth group and our youth leaders here at church who help provide a sense of community for our teens. But this study especially showed that young people who are, feel ostracized, who don't feel connected in their schools, especially are feeling entombed. They're desolate. They're in despair. Those are the ones who are most at risk of suicide at these times. And the study shows that any kids who's subject to bullying, Towards, uh, has been feeling the oppression of racism, getting bullied because of their race, or because of their gender and orientation. LGBTQ kids especially are feeling impacted and feeling isolated in communities. So this sense of community is so important. I'm really grateful for our youth group here, like I said, who, who provides a sense of community for young people. Recently, I heard this story. Now, some of you have heard this, but if you're new to this church, or maybe haven't worshipped here before, there's a story about what we do here in this church, what we're going to do as part of this worship service. For about 60 years ago, the Methodist Church in Haver burned down. In fact, last fall, I did a, a funeral service for Norman Mays, who was a longtime fire chief across the street for the fire department in Haver. Well, it was the first year that Norman was a firefighter, and he fell through the roof of the Methodist church as it was burning, trying to keep it from burning, trying to save the organ. It turns out only four brass offering plates were saved that day. The church leaders were determined to rebuild, and the youth group took red bricks from the ashes and they cleaned them up and they sold them to family members to try to raise money to build a new church. The church council and the pastor worked to get a loan from the bank and they got one and they started the construction of a new church and it, it took a while so the pastor and the congregation worshiped at another location every Sunday while well, they raised money to try to continue building this beautiful building that we're sitting here today. You can see that they were successful, but there was a time when it looked like it wasn't going to happen. The community fell on hard times. The campaign stalled. For several months, the church fell behind on their bills to the bank. 
And the bank was going to foreclose on the Methodist church in Haver. The pastor and the church leaders shared this information with the church, and they decided that as Easter was coming, they were going to make a special offering and ask people to dig deep, to put their offering in church on Sunday morning, that they would have a special processional. And since we are sitting here today, you know that they were successful on that day. And every year since then, this church has had a processional. And no, it's not to show off the Easter finery. And no, it's not to focus on the money. Because thank the Lord, we're not in the same situation today. But it's to remember who we are. That we're a church who once thought it was going to be dead. But it had faith that it could be resurrected. And so we... We have this processional of offering because we re are resurrection people. We believe that God is still rolling stones today and that hope is always there, even in the darkest of times. We tell the Easter story and we sing these Easter anthems each year on this special Sunday. He is risen. And you all reply back, he is risen indeed. And we proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life that begins right now when we claim this gift that we've been given in Jesus Christ. So when we do our processional today, I'm going to ask you not just to put money in the basket, but I'm going to ask you to take a moment and touch that cross and recommit your life to Christ. And if you would like to spend time at the altar, you are welcome to do that. This is a day to remember what it's all about. It's all about the risen Christ, isn't it? God is still rolling stones. And God invites us into the work of rolling stones together. Today, our hands and feet are needed each day to roll away the, the stones from the tombs of injustice, poverty, ignorance, loneliness, bullying, whatever it is, let us empty those tombs that imprison people today and creatures and all of creation too. I have one last thing to show you this morning. It's not a good sermon if it doesn't have a, a, a demonstration for me. <laughs> A few years ago, a good friend of mine named Kay Rogers was living with my husband and I. She was living through cancer treatments, both radiation and chemo, and I'd, I'd never lived with someone who had to go through that. Oh my gosh, what a dreadful thing it was. And there were days where she wasn't sure that she wanted to go on living, but she pushed on. And Her late husband had collected Frankoma pottery she gave this 1972 collector's plate to me and Jim. It's an Oral Roberts Association from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now the thing is, it's white and it's in relief, but you can't see it from where you are, can you? At the top of it, it says Easter 1972, and in the inner circle is a picture of a cave with a big boulder on the side, rolled away, and right above the circle it says, Jesus is not here. He is risen. Well, I get this plate out every year at Easter now, and then after Easter I put it away in the cupboard. And sometimes that happens in our lives too. We talk about resurrection and faith, of God transforming power at Easter, but then we easily go back to thinking that we have to be in control of everything, that we get to plan everything, that nothing in the church will get done without me or without you or whatever, and we put our faith in God in the cupboard instead of remembering that we are res resurrection people. Sometimes we fall into that human addiction of trusting our abilities to plan and execute our plans instead of seeking and trusting God's grace and power to guide and transform us into a beloved community. The truth is, we're, we're not perfect, are we? Our, our lives get wrinkled and torn, kind of like this tissue paper. Sometimes we're a little bit thin, and sometimes it's easy to get 
holes poked through us. We lose our patience. And yet, each day, God's grace, we get to write a new story for ourselves, a resurrection story. And I like to think of our lives being like tissue paper and, and that we, too, as we rewrite our daily story, every day when we get up, we get to imprint Jesus' resurrection story again on our lives each day. We get to remind ourselves of what he did and that we indeed are Easter people, that we get a new chance every single day to come out of the tomb, whatever we've done, whatever wrong, whatever mistakes. It's not the end, folks. We are Easter people. So much of our lives, we don't realize it, but people are watching us. And they see that imprint of Jesus on our lives. And it might not be perfect, and it might have holes in it. But when it's held up to the light of God's light shining through us, people can read it. They can see that Christ still lives. He lives within us. And think about what happens when we're in community and we do this with each other and for each other and we encourage each other. It becomes beautiful as the light shines through, as bright as the light shining through these beautiful stained glass windows. God light shines through the beauty of each one of you each day. I've seen it. No one can tell me it's not true that Christ is indeed alive in your hearts, in this place, and in this town. Thanks be to God. We are Easter people. He is risen. Let us sing together our next hymn, Hymn of Reflection. Easter people, raise your voices. And this is at the time at which I invite you at some part of the song, when you feel moved, I invite you to come down and place your hand upon the cross. Maybe kneel at the altar if you feel like it. Light a candle. And indeed, yes, you can put your uh, gift into the basket to remember that indeed this church once thought it was dead. But indeed, we are risen and alive. Oh. 